Chapter 17 The Ruin, Part 2 Are you done yet? Anna asked, shifting her weight from one side to the other, granting her stiff legs some small relief. The Countess tutted at the motion, continuing to prove she held no professional respect for personal space as she squinted at the measuring tape glowing blue in her magic. In just a moment, my sweet. You'll find the end result quite worth the wait. Anna resisted the impulse to suck in air for a deep sigh. She knew that such a disturbance would only extend her torment in the end. The two mares had been hidden away in Rarity's cabin for what felt like hours, which meant that it probably actually had been hours, considering the fact that Anna had developed a pretty good knack for estimating the passage of time. She spent an awful lot of it waiting around and watching, after all. At least the incessant pink one isn't involved. The Countess had insisted on privacy for the procedure, spouting some melodramatic prattle about the bond between artiste and canvas. Anna had since discovered that this bond largely consisted of standing still so long that she was about ready to fall over whenever she was allowed to move again. Ooh, I think that should quite do it. Rarity hummed a little ditty to herself as she marked the measuring tape with a pencil before backing off. The tape followed behind her like a loyal servant as she made for the stand-up curtain blocking Anna's view of a third of the room. Free from the seamstress's scrutiny, Anna heaved a heavy sigh. She wasn't even allowed to lay eyes on the dress until it was finished. She didn't have much tailoring experience beyond patching up the occasional damage to barding, but she was pretty sure that the final alterations would move along far faster if she was actually wearing whatever it was the Countess was trying to hide from her. Stupid pony superstitions. She was pretty sure it was a dress back there. She didn't like dresses. <sighs> At least the room is nice. Unlike Pinky's preferred decorating method of spraying her surroundings down with pink and floof, the Countess had a softer touch. Her cabin was clean and tidy, accented by complimentary splashes of pastel purples and greens. The faint smell of lilacs hung in the air. Rarity's humming devolved into an eager giggle. <laughs> oh, oh, I dare say it's finished! She sang. The tiny wheels of the curtain rattled as the unicorn brushed it aside to reveal her creation. Voila! Anna blinked. It was no wonder that the Countess had insisted on working behind a curtain. The mess of fabric scraps around her gave the impression of a careless fold that had torn up a cloudy night sky, shredded a foamy sea, and finally cracked open a morning sun before tossing it all together on the floor. Don't look at the mess, darling! Rarity whined. Look at the dress! Oh, right. Anna tore her gaze away from the hurricane of color, focusing instead on the clean lines of the dressed ponykin they surrounded. Her attention was immediately drawn to the polished, moonstone cabochon secured to the model's neck. The gem was nestled on a flower-shaped splash of glimmering silver. She would have paid for the chance to steal just a necklace with that design on its own, but the dress didn't stop there. Dark blue fabric seemed to flow from this centerpiece in sharp, sweeping arcs that reminded Anna of her own leathery wings, forming a light cloak that gradually deepened to hang just below the flanks, leaving plenty of space for the legs and tail to move. A wide purple hemline played along the edges of the cloak, twisting up into swirling patterns around the teardrops of clear glass that studded it like twinkling stars. Underneath was a loose-fitting blouse of pale blue, the soft pink laces on the neck left undone. The sleeves hung somewhat loose around the model's forelegs, giving the coat room to breathe and blooming out at the fetlocks to leave the hooves free. The entire ensemble looked almost as if it would float off to return to its home in the night sky if it was left unwatched. It's... Uh... Anna stepped closer, running a wingtip along the patterns of purple integrated into the cloak's hem. She laid a hoof on the silver flower that surrounded the moonstone gem. At first, she was surprised that it wasn't an actual flower. And then she remembered how long it had been since she'd seen that particular bloom. 
Is this supposed to be a certain flower? Night blooming serious, actually. Rarity beamed at her. Did you recognize it? I'm afraid it's been months since I saw one. She paused, some of her enthusiasm leaving her. Well, centuries, I suppose. Of course I recognize it. What self-respecting Thestral couldn't pick out the Princess of the Night in the Sea of Flowers? It's... beautiful. Rarity clapped her hooves together with renewed gusto. You simply must try it on. Come, come, I have some mirrors set up in my closet and we can... No, Anna said, cutting the seamstress off. She blinked, carefully dialing back the harshness in her voice. She still had to be Anatomy the refugee after all. I mean, thank you, Countess. It's the greatest gift any pony's ever given to me. She resisted the urge to flick her tail. Why did it bother her to speak that lie when a thousand others had flowed freely before it? But I'm still worn out from the fight with the bounty hunters, I think. I'd like to go back to my cabin. Rarity's lips twisted into an ignoble pout. Are you certain, dear? I don't want to pressure you, but there is truly nothing that would make me happier right now than seeing you glow in this couture. Sorry, Auntie, Anna said. Some other time, I'm sure. Rarity sighed. <sighs> Very well, then. Her horn glowed, and the dress tugged itself free of the model. The sound of her magic and rustling cloth filled the little cabin as she carefully folded the dress into a small box. A set of four silver shoes settled down on top before she closed it, securing the box with a thin pink ribbon. Do feel better soon, Anna, she said, levitating the box before her. Thanks. Anna hooked the ribbon with the clawed tip of a wing. She left the cabin at a measured pace, careful to not look back. Sea Saber's voice buzzed into Twilight's ear. Opening the outer lock. A cloud of bubbles obscured her sight as the heavy metal hatch swung open. Twilight raised a hoof to step forward, only for Flint to shove in front of her. Oh, not this time you don't, he growled. I go first. Oh, great. Twilight moved back. Sorry. Flint grunted as he used the air jets built into his armor to push himself out into the open water. He hung for a moment before drifting down to the stone bulk of the collapse tower beneath them and landed with a deep thud. Twilight poked her head out and watched him cast the red light mounted on his shoulder around the ruins. Mm, looks clear enough, he said. Come on and join me, light. Twilight dropped down by his side bending her knees to absorb the impact of the fall. She was at first surprised that no sand cloud was stirred by her landing. Every time she had ever set Huff outside of the sub, there had been at least a thin layer of sediment waiting below, obscuring her vision for a couple of seconds when she landed. But of course there isn't one here, she thought. This dead land is still fresh. Twilight clicked her radio on. We're out. We'll make our way towards the other end of the skyrock and search for... She paused, licking her dry lips. The search for clues. Acknowledged, Saber replied. We'll be scanning from above for any trouble. Torpedoes are at the ready for fire support if necessary. Applejack's uncertainty was easy to hear, even with the distortion from the radio. For a certain meaning of ready, I reckon... You'll be fine, cow filly, Flint said. Just press the right fire button when old Saber tells you. I'll be sure to kill anything down here before you have to reload, just to make it easy on you. Uh, thanks, I guess. Tala took a moment to adjust to the strange sense of reduced weight, no doubt due to the island's continual sinking. She led the way along the top of the fallen towers the submarine floated above them. Its shadow passed over the divers, making it difficult to walk without stumbling over the scattered chunks of stone under hoof. 
Twilight summoned a small purple orb light to hover above and behind her, illuminating the surrounding rubble with enough clarity for walking. What she had thought to be just more rocks was revealed to be a buried corpse, and she stiffened as her armored hoof crunched through bone. Watch your step there, Flint rumbled as he walked past her. He kept his shoulder light trained on the ground in front of him, taking care to maneuver around the mangled cadavers. Twilight took a deep breath as she took her weight off the leg she had stepped on. She was getting too used to it. She wasn't even sure if the corpse had startled her more than the surprise of stepping on something unexpected. The submarine's powerful lamps played over the ruins to either side, picking out shattered architecture, torn up earth, and the extruding parts of the dead buried beneath. In some places, the rubble had held together enough to be recognizable as storefronts or homes. Many of the bodies were merely broken or battered, but some bore the marks of more gruesome endings. Flesh rent from limbs, and deep gashes in the flesh marked those ponies who had been hunted rather than crushed. They often had limbs or entire halves of their bodies missing altogether. But there was no airship to be seen. Not yet, at least. Twilight returned her focus forwards as she and Flint came to a break in the tower. The tower here hung out over a seemingly endless abyss. Twilight peered down into the darkness, her hoof sending a spray of rubble sinking into the black. Looks like we'll have to jump, Twilight said. You want me to carry you across? Flint asked. Twilight shot him a sidelong glance, hidden by her helmet. I think I'll manage. The submarine's lamps traveled across the wide gap. The other island chunk was sitting at a steep angle, as if one edge had risen up out of the water as it sank. Most of the buildings had slid down to the lower side, all piling up on top of each other. We can aim for that hole there, Flint said, indicating a collapsed section of wall that led into the depths of the rubble. But we won't be able to see if there's an airship wreckage from in there, Twilight said. What if we pass them? Can't you use that spell of yours? He asked. Trails is looking for the sub, too. Between the two of you, I think it'll work out. The entire island flared with a sudden brightness. Twala raised a hoof to shield her visored eyes as she turned towards the source of the light. The mysterious shooting star from before had arced back into view, painting the ruins with its harsh glow. It's coming closer, Trails said over the radio. I can't tell how fast. We'd best get moving, then, Flint said. The big jumble will make for good cover. Twilight grimaced. As much as she hated the thought of possibly passing over her friends, Flint was right. The ping spell wouldn't have any trouble finding the metal hull of a wrecked ship among all the stone and earth of the fallen city. If they were down here, she'd find them. Even if she wanted nothing less. Let's go, she said. The two of them jumped together, propelling themselves across the gap with jets of pressurized air. Floating debris acted like tiny clouds to the miniature sun of the unknown creature approaching, casting misshapen shadows over the city. Flint landed fast, absorbing the impact with his hooves and training his guns on the enclosed areas he skidded to a stop. Twilight was more cautious, using her air jets to counter her velocity before landing. She floated her orb light forward into the gaping hole before them. The purple glow drifted silently deeper into the tunnel. Flint grunted as he led the way after it. Uh, this place has given me the creeps. You? Twilight asked. Her horn glowed brighter as she began sending pings through the surrounding superstructure. The knot in her stomach tensed with every signal out and relaxed as each one returned with no terrible omen of her friend's waterlogged grave. Her voice threatened to shake, but she needed something to keep her mind off of what she was doing. That's not like you. Just look at that. Flint gestured towards one side with a hoof. Twilight followed the motion, spotting a pair of bodies sticking out of the wall. 
their lower halves had been crushed together by the surrounding architecture, leaving the limp upper halves to sway freely in the current. Each one had its hooves wrapped around the other. Twala looked away before she could see the faces. A spiteful rush of anger flared up in Twala's chest. You only care about bodies when they come from your world, Flint. She gnashed her teeth, pushing the heat back down. She didn't want to risk upsetting herself while her magic was active. Flint looked back at her. He slowed his pace to let her close some of the distance between them. I know I've been a bit rough with you, Light, he said. His voice was low, a grave contrast from his usual boisterous volume. Nah, I'm guessing that apocalypse of yours ain't never been so close to home for me till now. Tall I didn't turn to meet his gaze. That had sounded almost like an attempt at an apology, but she was still focused on reining in her unruly emotions. Instead, she quickened her pace, using a boost from her suit's air jets to drift into the lead. Saber's voice crackled into her ear. That thing is getting too close. Applejack, be ready to fire two one on my mark. Toilet and Flint, stay at the ready. Roger that, boss, Flint said. Applejack's acknowledgement was less steady than Flint's, despite her attempt otherwise. Sure thing, Sugar Cube. The tunnel widened around her as Twilight pressed further into its depths. She sent her orb light up, allowing its steady purple glow to pick out the edges of a small pocket formed within the bubble. A deep fish corpse was splayed out here, its ragged hide punctured on both sides by a metal pipe. Flint's shoulder light played over a trio of pony bodies piled up against a thick metal beam opposite the deep fish. The larger stallion body was marred with deep cuts and bruises, but the two foals behind him looked almost peaceful in death. That pony's got my respect, he said, fighting off one of the deep fish before going down. Here's hoping he found some peace at the end. Twilight said nothing. There was still some lingering anger over the sudden appearance of Flint's appreciation for the dead. Her eyes followed the beam behind the bodies up to where it was lodged into the rubble. Some part of her imagined it to be some valiant defender, holding up the weight of an island in honor of the pony who had died defending the helpless. Part of the island is breaking free near you two. Chell's voice said over the radio. Brace yourselves! A deep rumble passed over the island as if on cue. Twilight could feel the shifting motion of the superstructure through her hooves, and found herself instinctively squatting low as small rocks dislodged themselves from above before thunking against her visor. She yelped as a heavy wad of bricks bounced off her armored flank, pushing her to the ground with its impact. Ah, uh, buck! Flint growled. The whole place is coming down round us. Looking up from the ground, Twilight saw the metal beam shift dangerously, straining against the mass of the city above them. <laughs> Stay near me, Flint! She said, wrapping the beam in her magic. She didn't know if her shield would hold if the little cave collapsed, but hoped that her telekinesis would be enough to keep the beam in place. The disturbance was over as quickly as it started. Tolly took a deep breath as the water relapsed back into its dead silence, allowing her magic to fade. The beam shifted. Twilight's eyes focused in on the chest-sized rock falling for her face just in time for her to let out a strangle. <laughs> the rock bounced off as if it was made of paper. Tolly blinked, confused by the lack of impact. Twy, you all right? Applejack asked. She's fine, Flint said. We're fine. Just a bit of a scare. I'm fine, EJ, Twilight confirmed. She picked herself off the ground, wrapping the rock in her magic and pulling it closer. It was a soggy cardboard package, neatly gift-wrapped in yellow paper with pink ribbon, miraculously still in one piece. Get back to open water. Saber said. The city is still settling into place, and we don't know how much longer it'll be before it hits bottom. 
Roger that, boss. Twilight formed a small shield around the package, teleporting the water out with a flash of purple. It fell apart like a marathon runner collapsing at the end of a race, revealing the trio of envelopes sealed inside. That star creature is up to something, Trail said. It almost looked like it's tracking you two in there. We should get moving, Light, Flint said. You can fiddle with whatever you got there when we're somewhere safer. Just give me a second, Twilight said, waving his words off with a huff. She recognized these envelopes. Pinkie Pie had been relentless in bugging her for weatherproof envelopes since she had heard about the spell Twilight had placed over her old library. With bated breath, Twilight found one addressed to her and slid open the seal. A spray of confetti popped out, the accompanying party horn muted by the water and her helmet. She pulled out the letter inside, a tentative smile pulling at her lips as she noticed the cupcake tucked beside it and opened it. Thick, happy, pink and blue letters waited inside. You're invited, it read, to Pinkie Pie's getting the gang together party at Altalusha, this question mark, question mark, question mark. At the bottom of the letter, a small note had been written in Pinkie's bouncy script. P.S. Don't worry about us, Twilight. I just had a hoof twitch, a rumpage, nose flick, and that means everything's gonna be okay. Just relax and come enjoy the party. A breathy laugh escaped Twilight's lips. Oh, Pinkie Pie, this is absolute nonsense. The laugh returned, fuller and freer. It didn't make any sense. But Twilight had never known Pinky to operate within the confines of logic. If one of Pinky's invitations had found its way to her through a minor apocalypse with an assurance of well-being at the bottom, then that was good enough. What you got there anyway, Light? Flint asked, stepping in front of her. <laughs> it's... It's from Pinkie Pie, she said. What was she crying for? Her friends were alive. She hadn't failed them, too. She says she and Rarity are all right. Oh, there, Nellie. Applejack's voice buzzed into her ear. Y'all got a lot of from Pinkie? Down there? <laughs> I'll explain once you're back to the sub, Twilight said. She took a deep breath, wearing a goofy smile inside the privacy of her helmet. But I believe our friends made it out okay. Well, if it's good enough to convince y'all, then it's good enough for me, Applejack said. Mission accomplished, then, Saber said. Was that a hint of relief in her voice? Find some open water and we'll pick you up. Right. Twilight tucked the letter back into its envelope, being careful not to smudge too much of the cupcake frosting. She renewed the weatherproofing spell. She let the shield fizzle, levitating the three letters into a rigid pocket on her dive suit. With the package safely stowed, she once again began sending out arcane pinks. Scanning for a way out now! That glowing thing is right on top of you two! Trail said. Watch out! Twilight's pings were coming back to her distorted. Her pulse quickened as she sensed the way they seemed to wrap around an invisible line through space, curling tighter and tighter. A shrill, warbling cry echoed through the ocean as the distortion seemed to thicken around Flint. Get back! Twilight reached out with her magic, throwing Flint to the side as a beam of brilliant white light blasted into the cavern where he had stood. A billowing cloud of bubbles rushed over them, and Twilight could feel her coat heating even through the thick shell of her armor. She cried out as she was thrown back by the wave of boiling water, tumbling backwards until she collided with a low-hanging protrusion of bricks. Applejack, fire! Saber shouted. Twilight shook the stars from her vision as she rolled back onto her hooves. Oh, hey, to one off! Applejack replied. Twilight began to send out the pings again, gauging the telltale distortion of the feedback for signs of the attacker. Flint was back on his hooves already, charging for the clear circular hole that had been burned through the rubble wall. He was still glowing red with heat. Think you're gonna take me out without a fight, do ya? He growled. 
Come and get it, then! The deep thud of his repeater bounced around the cavern as he fired out into the open ocean. It's not working! Trail said. Flash storm failed! Chala began to run for the hole. A spotlight of brilliant white light shone down on Flint through it, framed in licks of twisting purple and curling red. Saber didn't miss a beat. Applejack fired tube two on my mark! Yes, ma'am! Twilight finally made it to Flint's side. She squinted up towards the glare of their attacker, a trying to make out its shape as it danced ever closer. Her heart skipped a beat as the pings began to distort again, this time curling around something she couldn't see, off to the side. It's aiming for the sub! She said, propelling herself towards the open ocean with her air jets. It's going to shoot again! Saber, get out of the way! Again, the high-pitched call sounded. Twilight's vision went white. She could still hear the low rumble of the tunnel shifting around her, and feel the little rocks bouncing off her armor, but it was impossible to see anything through the overbearing brightness. Brace! Saber ordered. A painful surge of static popped in Twilight's ears. The sound of the submarine's metal hull colliding with hard stone carried clearly through the water. Twilight gnashed her teeth, trying to blink the light away. The afterimage of a ragged bird, framed by a circle of molten stone, had burned itself into her retinas. She didn't even know where she was anymore. She filled out with her hooves, searching for something solid. <laughs> Damage report! Saber barked. <laughs> Spalling! Trails hissed. I'm bleeding, but I'm good! One of these racks broke back here, Applejack said. Everything's all over the place, I don't know what's what! Twilight's eyes were covered enough for her to see. She had floated nearly all the way through the melted tunnel. She reached out, grabbing onto the lip and pulling her head out into open ocean. Still blinking away the bird after image, she picked out the submarine's dark shape lodged in a crack running through a chunk of island. The swimming star from before floated before it, its glow having diminished enough for her to make out a pair of wings splayed out in the center. Her pings were distorting again, sending around the submarine. The monster was going to shoot again, and this time there would be no chance of evasion. The sinister fury flared in Twilight's breast, her magic pooling unbidden in the tip of her horn. End that troublesome beast! Flynn's voice rumbled over the radio. What are you doing over there, you shiny moron? His repeater thumped, thumped, thumped to Twilight's side, and she turned to see him floating a short distance off in the ruins, firing both guns at the monster's back. I thought you wanted to play with me! The monster's warbling cry sank through the water once more. Its glow brightened and danced over the ruins as it turned, a pair of white-hot eyes locking on a flint. Twilight forced her magic down, trying not to dwell too much on the way it resisted her will. Her friends were safe, for now. She wouldn't risk losing control again until it was absolutely necessary. Instead, she used her air jets to tackle Flint, pushing him out of the way just as another lance of super hot light boiled the water where he had been. I don't think your bullets are working! We need to run! Flint let loose a guttural roar. Damn it! Why don't we ever dive around things that die when you shoot them anymore? Fine! Twilight glanced back at the monster again. Its light had diminished enough for her to see its curved beak stretch unnaturally wide to release a furious cry. 